Okay, this is uh, Chapter 17, Reflections and Visual Sources. Let's talk about history and horse races. So historians have always been fascinated by historic firsts. Historians and even students of history often uh, obsess about the first achievements as they represent breakthroughs in human development. But a focus on firsts can be misleading. Most first achievements in history were not intentional, and the Industrial Revolution was certainly an unexpected outcome of converging circumstances. So yet this can lead to the assumption that being first implies that one is somehow better. So Europeans used their development of industrialization to claim an innate superiority over others. It's uh, important to emphasize the unexpectedness of the Industrial Revolution. And the spread of industrialization around the world diminishes the importance of the why Europe question. Industrialization will increasingly be seen as a global process. So world historians stress the unexpected nature of British and European industrialization and thus note that it was not preordained by an alleged European superiority. And perhaps the spread um, is more important than it's in, you know, when it, init it was initiated. Uh, in the future, historians might not be concerned with who was first to industrialize but how this form of production spread around the world, similar to, say, the spread of agriculture. And that's why the agricultural revolution thousands of years ago and the industrial revolution um, are compared to being such hu vastly important uh, breakthroughs in human development. Okay. Visual source number one, the machinery department of the Crystal Palace. Okay, so what overall impression of Britain's industrial technology was this engraving intended to convey? You know, notice the building itself as well as the machinery. Well, the scale, the intricacy, and the complexity of the machinery and the sophistication of the manufacturing process on display indicate that British manufacturing technology was on the cutting edge of industry. And the setting contributes to the sense of how this machinery shaped British life. The building was considered a marvel of its time and was built with steel and glass and produced by British factories using similar machinery. And so even though working conditions were harsh and foul and dank, this still shows... Um, a sophisticated society with sophisticated developments. So how are the visitors to this exhibit portrayed? You know, what, what segment of British society do you think they represent? Does their inclusion suggest um, about the beneficiaries of the Industrial Revolution? It's a very interesting question. Uh, the visitors here are portrayed as interested spectators um, in family units, indicating that the outing was suitable for all genders and ages. Oh, man, I thought my highlighter was on. Erase that. Okay. There we go. All right, and we see children over here. And they're dressed in clothing that suggests middle and upper class backgrounds. Um, no working class figures are present. Um, they all look to be dressed up for an outing, not for work. Um maybe members of the privileged classes. And the middle class and the industrial bourgeoisie classes were the chief beneficiaries of the Industrial Revolution, gaining not only uh, greater material wealth from the profits of industry, but also free time to, to attend such events. So they not only gained money, but also leisure time. All right, let's look at uh, the railroad as a system of the industrial era. So what attitude toward the railroad in particular and the industrial, industrial age in general does this image suggest? Um, I think this is a fantastic image here, and it represents the Industrial Revolution quite well. It was a, it's seen as a positive development that allowed for greater leisure and travel time. And the Industrial Age provided new opportunities for people and improved the quality of life for some. And that's what it's meant to convey here. 
But notice the view out the window. Why do the telegraph lines and St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, a famous feature of the London landscape, how does that contribute to the artist's message? What's the point of putting that back there? Well, the telegraph lines remind the viewer of other advances ushered in by the Industrial Revolution that have helped to improve communication. And St. Paul, from an artistic standpoint, provides a familiar background. From the perspective of the new industrial society, it reminds the viewer of how the new developments have cut into the heart of the old cities. Right? Also shown in the train crossing the Thames River. And how these new technologies coexist with the older accomplishments of pre-industrial England. So it's a happy marriage of both. And what marks this family's middle class? How would you compare this image with the painting of the middle class um, that's in your book? Um, I believe it's on page 838. The, do the two families derive from the same segments of the middle class? Do you think they mix or could mix socially? Well, the details that mark the family's middle class here include their travel on a train in what seems to be a luxury cabin car, uh, their dress, the father's ability to read, um, as represented by the newspaper, and the fact that they're probably returning from a vacation or uh, some other leisure leisure time activity. Now, looking at this image and the one from uh, your book, both families display the trappings of the middle class of their clothing and the items within their possession, but it's un unclear whether they derive from the same segments of middle class society. One family is returning from probably a vacation while the other is having tea or coffee in their home. But you could make the case that the family from the image in your book is of a higher social standing because of their dress. There's a servant, um, the quality of the porcelain table setting, that would be unlikely to mix with the family on the train. That's There's an argument to be said there for that as well. Okay, outside the factory, the dinner hour. I think this is uh, an excellent image. How do you respond to this painting? Do you think it was an honest portrayal of factory life for women? Is there anything missing? Well, you might conclude that the factory setting and the clothing and demeanor of the women indicate an honest portrayal of factory life. That's possible. But you could also argue that the scene has an um, idyllic quality that may be misleading, with women happily socializing during one of their few moments of rest and a long day of work. Uh, uh, the reality is not, m not many even got a break. Uh, but they're in simple but clean attire on a brick-paved square that gives no indication of the real squalor and overcrowding common in many urban neighborhoods. And missing from the scene is the squalor of urban life. None of the women display injuries from their work. Uh, the scene depicts one of the few periods of rest of a day dominated by intense labor. And probably... If they even received a break, it's not happy socializing, um, fun time. It's got to take a break. Let me sit down and rest, catch my bearings, uh, try to get back to homeostasis and get going again. So why do you think uh, the painter Crow set the scene outside the factory as opposed to within the factory? Well, the outside setting is more aesthetically pleasing, that's for sure. Uh, much better light, even more interesting background than inside the factory itself. And women interacting socially rather than in a work situation provided a more interesting subject. right? But it also gave us something to talk about as well. And he probably wished to depict these women in a more human setting rather than um, a factory setting. But notice the details of the painting. The one, young women's relationships to, to one another... Um, the hairnets on their head, their clothing, their activities. What marks them as working class women? You know, what impression of factory life uh, did Crow, the arter, want to convey in this image? Is he trying to highlight or minimize the class differences of industrial Britain? Well, the details that mark their working class status include their clothing, their presence in a public setting without men from their household, 
uh, eating in public on the street, their hairnets, which indicate uh, status as factory workers. And Crow does, does not portray any of the deprivations, the monotony, or the dangers of factory work. Instead, he focuses on a brief period of rest and socializing in what otherwise was a long and nasty, difficult work day. And because Crow neglects to include many of the worst problems in factory life, could argue that he's seeking to minimize class differences um, in this image. You could also argue that by choosing these women as a subject for a painting, that would be viewed by middle and upper class observers. Right? So he could be highlighting class differences. Just depends on the perspective. Okay. Inside the factory, uh, Lewis Hines showing child labor in 1912. And this is an actual photograph. So what impressions of factory life does Hines seek to show in this photograph? Uh, intense labor, obviously, the crowded and dirty conditions, the use of child labor. How do women and children in this image compare to those from the previous source? This one. Well, here the women are shown at work rather than leisure time. They're inside rather than outside. So that, you know, the background also um, sets the mood for the, the image. Their clothing is less substantial and they're less likely to have shoes. Right? Some of the kids didn't even have shoes. Oh, gosh. And the supervision by factory management is clear. So how would you imagine a conversation between Hein and Crow discussing these two images? So we have Crow's painting here and Hein's image here. Well, Hein, as a social campaigner, would likely point out the romanticized aspects of Crow's painting. Question the choice of leisure settings rather than factory work scene, and point out the lack of urban squalor. But Crow might question the aesthetic values of Hines photo. You know, they probably agreed that the working class were worthy of being shown in images, and that such depictions provide an opportunity to raise awareness among the elites of the factory workers' lives. But notice the male figure here, smoke in the pipe. What do you think his role in the factory might be? He could be a floor manager or the factory owner. Um, those are probably the two most likely possibilities. And, you know, when you look at this photograph, um, is, it a, is it a photograph necessarily more truthful image than a painting? Because this is a painting and this is a photograph. Is it more truthful? Consider the advantages and disadvantages of each source of information. So the camera does faithfully replicate the scene before its lens. However, it can be difficult to assert that a photograph is necessarily more truthful because a photographer can shape the image, for example, by choosing the lighting or the angle at which the photo is taken, and the photographer can also stage or alter a scene before taking the photo. But a painting depicts the scene through the eye of the artist and is therefore subjective. Right? Nonetheless, the artist is capable of creating a painting that faithfully depicts a scene, so it's possible that some paintings may be more truthful than photographs. Uh, something to think about. And let's look at our last image. Oh, I think um, this Capital and Labor by John Leach, I think this is a wonderful image. How precisely would you define that theme? Uh, the leisure, wealth, luxury of the rich are made possible by the labor, suffering, and deprivation of workers. Now, how are the sharp class differences of industrial Britain represented in this visual source? Well, the class differences are represented in the juxt juxtaposition of well-dressed, upper-class figures being waited on by servants, surrounded by luxurious furnishings and pets, and placed at the top of the panel and depicted in color. Well, the working class, um, including poor women and children, um, those stopped, or excuse me, stooped with age and industry and engaged in hard mining labor in the background, the working poor, their place at the bottom of the panel, depicted in shades of brown and gray, while the overseer to the left is in color. I think that's interesting. How does this visual source connect the 
Industrial Revolution with Britain's colonial empire. Well, notice the figure in the upper right reclining in exotic splendor. Right? Perhaps in India. And the figure to the far upper right of the panel seems to be uh, a native colonial elite figure represented by a servant and dress, the exotic furnishings, even a pet parrot. But to what extent does the image correspond with Karl Marx and Frederick Engels' description of industrial society that we saw um, in Document 4? How does it compare with the poster that's in your book? Um, I think it's 840-something. Uh, 840, 2, 843, something like that. Well, the visual source possesses many features that correlate well with um, what's seen here and uh, document four from your book. Uh, including the sharp con contrast between privileged bourgeoisie and the exploited proletariat. The integration of the entire world into the bourgeoisie system is represented by the figure in the top right of the panel. And there's a sense of humans as mere labor commodities to be used up in industrial toil. However, not all of the Marx selection is represented. Um, there's no sign of the class struggle or revolution envisioned by Marx and Engels. Nor is there a sense of the great strides in productivity brought on by industrialization. But the poster in your book uh, reflects many of the Marx and Engels assertions, especially that the workers produce the wealth in society and that the capitalists, through their control of the government and army, exploit the workers. And it also reflects Marx and Engels' assertion that religion is used by capitalists to fool the workers. Again, the class struggle is not represented in that picture, although it does show the circumstances that Marx and Engels felt would inevitably lead to a class struggle. So how might you understand the figure to the, the figure of the woman and the small angel behind a door at the left? Right here. How do you interpret that in this image? Well, these figures might represent hope on the other side of the door from the struggling workers. The angel could mean many things and perhaps even indicate that immigration may provide an outlet for these workers. And that concludes our reflections and visual sources for uh, revolutions of industrialization.